You could choose to be an exception. You could hope that it plays out differently. But my job is to tell you the broader rules. You can carve out the exceptions, and I would be thrilled for you to let me know if and when I am wrong, because it doesn't matter to me. All that matters is that you're happy and that you're living your life according to your values, not according to my values. Hey, this is Evan Marcat, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women. You're a personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You podcast. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about dating relationships and men from a man's point of view and hopefully get you into the relationship that you've always sought. Before we begin today, this is going to be an interesting episode. I've never done one like this before where the whole point of the episode is to detail all the ways in which I've been wrong. Notice I've gone 300 podcasts and this is the first one I'm doing where I say I was wrong. And if that seems like a really low ratio, consider the other podcasts you listen to and how many times they've taken a whole episode to admit that they're wrong. I still think I'm ahead. If you enjoy the Love You podcast, if you enjoy this brand of honesty and truth telling, please go to Apple. Please go to Spotify. Give us a positive review. Give us five stars. Say something nice. I give my soul to you and make sure you subscribe so you can listen to every single episode. So I've been doing this for 20 years now. It's now probably over 20 years. I started in 2003. And when you do anything for a long time, hopefully you get better at it over time. And hopefully you evolve. It would be next to impossible to come out of the womb knowing how to do any job. And it would be almost next to impossible not to evolve over time as you get more experience and gather more data. I hope you are a different person now than you were five years ago, 10 years ago. 20 years ago. Uh, So if you can evolve and become a different person with different life circumstances and perhaps different beliefs, I hope that I have the freedom to do so as well. Uh, Maybe the ways I've changed are uh, somewhat subtle. Maybe it's not anything radical. Probably don't think anything I've I've, uh, been wrong on is radical to the point where I'm not terribly embarrassed about any of it. But I do think it's important to do a mea culpa from time to time, if only to let you know that, you know, just because I run around giving advice doesn't mean that I think I'm right in every situation or that I'm infallible or superhuman or, you know, I've I've had many, many forms of arrogance thrown at me over the years. And yes, it takes a certain level of uh, confidence to run around telling other people what they should do in their love life. But you know, like everybody else, um, just just a human being, have my biases, have my blind spots, have my experiences to justify why I believe what I believe, and have had some measure of success helping other people uh, navigate these tricky waters. So whatever I share with you today, uh, I wouldn't say it's confidential um, because it's out on the internet, but it is my methodology for helping to share with you how if your dating coach could have blind spots, uh, it's certainly possible that you might too. To dispense with a few things at the top, there are far more things that I've done wrong than than I can share in a limited podcast. I don't like to do two-hour podcasts, so this is going to be you know, 15, 20 minutes of this. Some of them happen over and over. Arguing with strangers on the internet, I have done that wrong a lot, notably on my blog. Uh, I have a blog. I still have a blog. If you go to evanmarkatz.com forward slash blog uh, or evanmarkatz.com forward slash search, you could search a thousand blog posts that I wrote for about 15 years. I blogged twice a week uh, writing articles the way I now do on Substack. I did that for 15 years on my blog. Uh, I still post my podcast on my blog. But the comment sections were really, really lively. My blog has over 140,000 comments, uh, and not all of them uh, were praise from my mom. So it was a lot of dialogue, right? An average blog post would have 75, 100 comments of people who are regular readers sharing their thoughts, arguing, issuing their opinions. In 2016, I had over a million people a, a month coming to my blog. Over 12 million people that year came to my blog just by Googling stuff in the middle of the night. Um, and so it was a hot, it was a, a hot rod. No, hot rod is not the right word. It was a, 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 like a lightning rod for divisive conversation from all corners of the internet. And I always try to play the the moderate, right? I'm not, you know, I'm not pro man. I'm not pro woman. I'm, I try to be as neutral as I can. Uh, and, offer my best best take. Um, but 
I got drawn into the trenches too many times uh, when someone attacks you uh, on your website. Uh, imagine going to work every day and getting a post-it on your computer with someone telling you how much you suck, how stupid you are, how ugly you are, what an idiot you are. That's what it's like to get a post-it note every day or a few of them every day on your computer telling you how much you suck. And too many times I took the the, the bait and went back and forth in the comments and sometimes uh, said things that were uh, regrettable and didn't take the high road. And that is something that I regret. If any of this interests you, definitely search my blog. There's some really juicy comment sections um, about every subject under the sun. And the blog is also really, really well categorized. So if you go through it, you will notice that, that when I rebuilt my website in 2021, there's categories, there's subcategories for not just the six uh, pillars of love you, confidence, meeting men, dating, understanding men, relationships, and commitment, um, but there's all these subcategories because if you write for that many years, you're going to cover a lot of a lot of ground and answer a lot of reader questions. So highly recommend you check that out. Again, this post was not intended to drive you to my blog. It was more, that's where a lot of my public mistakes took place. I also had a bad habit once upon a time of calling out other people who gave bad advice. I remember a handful of times, I, I won't cite them because then you'll go to their website and look up this stuff, but there was a handful of times where some people gave some really bad advice and I commented on it or wrote about it on my blog and just started the firestorm. People, their readers would come to attack me and I would go to their website to defend myself. And then there would be negative blog posts written back and forth. It's the internet. It was awful. So it's not that my opinion of bad advice has changed. I still think there's a lot of good people giving bad dating advice. It's that I don't see fit to comment on it on it anymore. Uh, I'm not the police of the internet. Uh, people are allowed to disagree and give bad advice and have people praise their bad advice. Uh, I'm just trying to stay above the fray at this point in time in my career. So I regret the way one regrets fighting with their spouse. I regret some of the behavior I had arguing with with strangers on the internet. More serious mistake that I made was. Uh, during the Me Too movement, the rise of the Me Too movement. It wasn't, uh, I don't regret the piece that I wrote about it. Uh, it was called Why, Why Good Men Don't Speak Out During the, uh, about Me Too. It was actually a really thoughtful full piece. It was shared 3,000 times. I was invited to be on CNN and declined. The thing I really regret about my very, very narrow stake in that was that there's a lot of statistics that are bandied about to justify attention. And one of the statistics that that got thrown around was something like one in six women was sexually assaulted. And for, I don't know, first you know, 10 plus years of my career, I had trouble believing that. And I had trouble believing that because it's not my way. It's something I've, I've never done. I don't have friends who are like that. My friends are kind of like me in that way. It's like, like it's just not not in our DNA to do that. And I know I sound like I'm being really naive. You could say, you know, every man has the capacity to do that, you know, but, but truly because I was in my own little bubble, I didn't act that way. No one I knew acted that way. It's not like my friends, you know, would ever endorse that or think it's okay or turn a blind eye to that. When Me Too came out and it was the size of a tidal wave and every woman online had a story, it really made me wake up and look twice and do a little bit more research and investigate statistics. And I've sadly come around to the idea that that, that indeed seems to be a valid statistic. And people could argue even further, it's not one in six, it's one in four. It, not the purpose of today's podcast. It is only to take ownership of the fact that in my head, I minimize the problem because I didn't see the scope of the problem through my very narrow, cis, hetero, upper middle class male perspective. That was a, an, an eye opener. And I've since worked with many, many women who have tales of sexual assault, uh, multiple sexual assaults, uh, molestation when they were kids, really, really horrifying things. While I'm still not you know, a psychologist who's qualified to handle early childhood trauma, I'm certainly more sensitive to it what, than I was when I was a 31-year-old dating coach starting out. Neither of these is the reason I'm doing today's podcast. I just think it feels good to come clean. The reason I'm telling I'm doing today's podcast is because there have been these isolated incidents over the years where I have encouraged 
clients to break up or break off with men and they didn't do so. And their decision to ignore my advice turned out to be a good decision. So I'm going to tell briefly those stories because I think they're interesting. I know this whole thing is going to come up across a little bit like, you know, the job interview, my, my, my worst quality is that I'm a perfectionist. My worst quality is that I care too much. Like what I'm going to share right now sounds a little bit like self-praise. It's not my intention. It's always to try to teach something. And so I have a client. She's a Love You graduate. She has done sales for me. She has come on my retreats. Um, I, I've met her in person when she was on a Love You retreat in 2016-ish. I remember her telling me about the guy she was seeing, and she had a really strong connection with him. And it was sometime in the first month or so of dating. And she said, there's only one problem, right? I mean, he's a great guy. He just found out last week that after a one night stand he had a couple months ago that he is going to be fathering a child. Got a woman pregnant, woman decided to keep the kid against his will, and now he's gonna be fathering a child. And I said, okay, that sounds complicated to start dating a man who is just found out that he's having a child with a one night stand from about a month ago. That's messy. I wouldn't want to be a part of that situation at all, and I'm sure he's a great guy, and I'm sure you have a real good connection, and I promise you could, you could find another great guy where you have a really good connection where he is not having a child out of wedlock with another random woman at the same time he's dating you. I could promise you that guy exists. What is it now? 2024? They're married. They're together. They're happy. They found a way to make it work. I eat crow. That's fine. Another example. People I met on a, a, a business trip. Lovely individuals. It was, a, it was a, like, a, like a business coaching mastermind type thing uh, and, 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 and at a summer camp on the East Coast. So it was a lot of fun, but some real high-level speakers, all entrepreneurs, creatives, big thinkers. And again, there's 100 plus people. You become friends with a lot of people. You stay up late talking and drinking. And I stayed friends with, with people from this, this event independently. And I remember uh, there was a woman, she was in her mid-30s, very masculine energy woman, entrepreneur, telling me what she was looking for in a man. And what she was telling me was she was looking for the male version of her. And in my experience, it, that's kind of a no-no, is you don't want the male version of you. You want a compliment, not a clone. But she's like, I'm a digital nomad. I pick up and I move all the time. But I'm an entrepreneur and I want someone who also wants to build businesses with me. And she was basically, it seemed like she was trying to, to, to date herself, which again, I've done. Like it's, it's, it, it generally doesn't have a great track record. I said, you probably have to compromise on something in order to get that thing that you're looking for. Sure enough, she ends up with a guy from this event that we went to uh, who also is an entrepreneur who works in digital marketing, who builds businesses, who likes to travel, who's a digital nomad, who also doesn't want kids. She found out now he's more feminine energy than she is. So that's where the balance is. But she was looking for someone to fit into her very unique, complicated life. And I told her she'd probably have to give up a piece of that. And she didn't. She got what she wanted. Another story. Client has a guy who lived with her. It was a boyfriend. They lived together for a while, blending families. It was really kind of confusing. He was in a bad place in his life post-divorce. They started to fight. He couldn't take on a masculine leadership role. She was carrying the burden for the whole family. Uh, they fought. They stopped having sex. They broke up. She came to me for coaching. We did prolific online dating. End of our time together. She got back together with her ex. I said, we don't recycle men. You already tried this on for size. It didn't work. You're the same person. He's the same person. I see no reason that you have to act like he's the last man on earth. There's another guy you don't have a rich history with. There's another guy who hasn't disappointed you. There's another guy who doesn't have to change to become the man you want him to. And she's like, he's, he's changed. He's different now. You don't understand. She was right. It worked. Which brings me to today, which is why I'm doing this podcast. I've got a client right now who has an ex 
who she broke up with because she didn't think he was intellectual enough, impressive enough, uh, charismatic enough, worldly enough. He's a nice guy. He leads a simple middle-class life, little beta energy, agreeable, but nice, sensitive, communicative, uh, always treated her well, lacking a little bit in confidence. And she let him go. And then they came back together after four months of coaching with me. She's telling me he's different. She's telling me he's changed. She's telling me the relationship's never been stronger because she finally accepted him instead of my, thanks to my coaching. She's like, I finally accepted him instead of expecting him to be someone else. And because I fully accepted him, he's really embraced commitment with me and wanting to be part of my family. And that's in process. I don't know where that's going to end up. The reason I share all of these stories is because A, goes to show, which you already know, I am not an oracle. Uh, I am not Nostradamus. Uh, I'm a guy who has experience, data, opinions, good track record, lots of weddings, lots of broken up relationships with women who should have dumped their guys, but clearly not perfect. The reason I'm telling you these stories is that they are exceptions. They are exceptional exceptions. These are a handful of things that I could pluck from decades of coaching that contradict my central premises. Some of the central premises is we don't recycle ex-boyfriends. We don't do long distance guys. We try to avoid guys in complicated situations because they're high risk, not because they're bad people. They're just high risk. The guy who's recently divorced is high risk. The guy who is between jobs, is high risk. The guy who impregnated someone else a month ago is high risk. I'm saying nothing about their character, saying everything about their situation and the timing. The rules remain rules for a reason. These aren't things that I just sort of concocted out of whole cloth just to scare you. All right. For the exceptions to these rules that I just cited, I think I just cited four of them. There are hundreds of women whose lives I've saved by saying, no, don't date a guy who lives nine hours away. No, don't go back to your cheating ex. No, don't date the guy who's clinically depressed and doesn't know what he wants out of life. It's not your job to save him. It's not your job to change him. It's not your job to keep your fingers crossed and hope things are better. It's your job to find a guy without all these complications. Right? We want a smooth on-ramp. We want a guy who, in the first month of dating, says, I want to be your boyfriend. We want a guy who is talking about a future. We want a guy who, two years in, proposes to you. Right? We want this real smooth thing, not all these externalities, right? long-distance exes that, that could really materially impact your future, where you end up sinking a lot of time and energy and love into someone based on wishful thinking. Oh, it would be great if... He wasn't an alcoholic. Oh, it would be great if he didn't smoke pot all the time. Oh, it would be great if I could trust him. So with something as high stakes as dating, you really want to eliminate risk. The same way you'd want to eliminate risk if you were investing in a company or investing in a house, and that's why you have a house inspector to make sure your house is not on a California fault line. You want to eliminate anything that is high risk. And so I don't mind sharing these stories. I don't mind doing a mea culpa or apologizing to the women in question who I tried to steer away from the love of their life and ultimately trusted them to make the right choice for them. Because my goal is not to say, I told you so. I take no pride out of I told you so. If anything, I really want these women to be happy. And my job is to help people navigate, right? To be their GPS, to steer them unerringly to the right direction instead of going way, way, way off course, which is so common when people date from old wounds, right? From fear, from scarcity. And choosing high-risk guys is always indicative of fear and scarcity because a high-value woman who's coming from a place of confidence and abundance generally wouldn't occur to her to try to re rehabilitate an old relationship where the guy disappointed her. She knows there's always a new guy who doesn't come with that measure of baggage. Just because I say something doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean you can't disagree with me, doesn't mean you could comment. You don't have to send me hate mail. I don't, I don't really need it. But you're allowed to disagree with anything I say here on this podcast. It's perfectly reasonable. What I'm suggesting is that you can sleep with a guy in a bar, in the bathroom, on the first date, be with him 40 years later, and simultaneously, that's not a good idea. 
the existence of, hey, this worked. My parents got married in two months after eloping to Vegas, right? I know someone who had sex on a first date and they're really happily married. The fact that there are plenty of exceptions don't negate the fact that the rules are rules for a reason. As long as you know what the rules are, you could choose to be an exception. You could hope that it plays out differently. But my job is to tell you the broader rules. You can carve out the exceptions and I would be thrilled for you to let me know if and when I am wrong because it doesn't matter to me. All that matters is that you're happy and that you're living your life according to your values, not according to my values. I try to give good ideas here that are vetted about dating slower, not being too caught up in chemistry, paying attention to how someone treats you, paying attention to whether you share the same long-term goals and values, paying attention at the very beginning so you don't make mistakes that hurt you one, two, three years down the road. All right, but ultimately, this is all up to you. If this has value to you, then wonderful. I appreciate it. Give me a positive review on Apple. Um, if you throw this all out and you discard it, that's perfectly fine too. I just want you to be happy. And I hope that comes across every time that I do one of these podcasts. Is, is, uh, there's, it's not about right or wrong. It's about, about effective and ineffective. And if you've been ineffective, despite your best intentions, despite your therapy, despite all the podcasts and books, if you've been ineffective in your, your quest for unconditional love, go to evanmorecats.com forward slash apply. Put in your name and email address, fill out an application, book a time with me on the phone. I'll talk to you. I'll listen to you. Tell me about your story, how you got here, where you're going, what you'd like to see happen. And maybe, just maybe, we can change your life forever. All right, and you could be one of my latest Love You success stories. Thank you for your time. I love you. I appreciate you. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Bye-bye.